Hi folks, uh, I'm Peter Violet. We, I'm, uh, I've been involved with 470 now since uh, 2012, so over 10 years, which is crazy. Um, I'm from Waterville, so I grew up on, playing on the locomotive. Um, my day job, I'm a rail engineer. And um, with New England Steam Corp, and we're restoring 470. Um, so this shot here is on the last run. Uh, this was taken by Kambach. And uh, this was the centerfold in, um, I think it was the September the 54 issue of Trains. It's a good shot. They, um, they rescanned it for us right when we started off. Um, so Main Central um, was a pretty good sized railroad uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. This is um, the extent of the railroad in 1916. And uh, I'll zoom into a couple places here. So first, oh. there we go. All right, so down in the Portland area, Southern Maine. Mountain Division through Vermont up into Canada. Uh, the Rangeley Lakes region and the, uh, the Sandy River. Then a line that went up to Moosehead Lake. Went all the way through Canada, this line's still open. The Callis Branch and the little spur to the ferry that went to Bar Harbor. And then here in the middle in Waterville where a lot of the lines combined. So going into the 20th century, Maine Central had a bunch of different locomotives from the pre predecessing railroads, um, but most of their power were 440s. And they also had some 460s for, for passenger service. Um, they were pretty small though, the largest one having 73 inch drivers, but they had 57 and 64 inch drivers here. Excuse me, 69. So they started investing in some uh, Pacifics. So they had four different cl classes of Pacifics. Um, they got the first one there in 1907. And each one just kept getting bigger. And then by 1924, they wanted to get two more and they wanted to upgrade them even more. So they put in an order to Alco Schenectady and they got 469 and 470. Now, uh, they put in the order in January of 24 and excuse me, I can't read this, um, ordered as a duplicate of 466 with booster engine for Portland and Bangor service. Uh, so here's 470 um, right in, in Waterville, right when she was first delivered. And in the main central magazine of the time, uh, the little article about 470 and 469 read, many peered from rear windows of the general office building quite a few mornings ago <laughs> when main central's two new passenger locomotives, giants of the Pacific type, ran by in the center of a long freight, Rigby to Waterville. They looked stylish, for a locomotive can be stylish, you know, and modern efficiency was written all over them. They have already been placed into service on the Portland and Bangor run. So 470 and 469 were put in for the regular service and the big name trains. Uh, so this shot here is 470 pulling a flying Yankee. And even by the 1930s, uh, they already started doing modifications to the locomotive. Uh, so there's already a new tender, and the pilot in the front here is, is now a cast iron pilot, as opposed to, it's hard to see here, but it was this pretty small little pilot. So either it broke, we aren't really sure, but she got, was given this cast iron pilot. And she actually ended up in you, you guys' territory quite a bit. Uh, this is southbound at Portland. Um, and this is in the late 30s, and even more modifications had taken place. Um, the bell was moved to, to the front of the smoke box. We aren't really sure why. There was a um, sort of like casing that was around the, the safety valves and the whistle on the top that was removed. And a uh, valve pilot was put on, and that's probably my favorite appliance. I think it's so cool. Um, so, and a steam locomotive, just like your car, the faster you're going in your car, you need to upshift. All right, well, with the steam locomotive that's cut off, where when you first start off, you wanna have steam in as much of the stroke as possible of the piston. But once you have momentum and you're going, you don't need to have steam in the whole stroke. So you start backing it off. Well, there's a fine point where you back it off too much and it starts bucking, or you, you're running it not efficient enough and, you, and you're wasting steam. So, an appliance was built in the 30s that would take the, the percent of cutoff that you were running the locomotive at and calculate and has, and it would take your speed and it would calculate the most efficient cutoff to run the locomotive. And then the, the display in the cab, 
the box was about this big with a dial with, with two hands on it. And when you get them lined up, you're running the locomotive most efficiently. And there at the bottom, there was a spool of paper and pencils and they would track and at the end you would roll it up and you bring it into the shop and they would evaluate how efficient you ran the locomotive of the day. It's pretty neat. Um, so this one might be familiar to you guys. This is coming into North Station. Um, this negative, this negative was huge. It was like this big um, when I scanned it, but I love this picture seeing the porter there on the right, just waiting, just casually standing there waiting for it to come in. And so 470 was, was in B&M territory all the time in the 30s and 40s. I mean, we have pictures. This is in, this next one here is in Wilmington, and this is pulling a milk train. So they really they did some weird stuff with 470. It was definitely outside of Maine quite a bit. But uh, the riding on the wall started to happen here in the 30s. So Flying Yankee um, was, came, came in, had air conditioning. Um, it was a much sleeker looking train. So the diesel started to come in and so when that happened, they put even more, more work in the locomotives. So this, it's the steam locomotives to get more efficiency. So this is 470 at its final configuration. So this appliance here, that is the valve, that's the valve pilot there. That's still on the locomotive and it's attached to, use my laser point. Does this show up on the camera? Yeah. Um, it takes in the cutoff here, which would be this rod. And there's a wheel, the steel wheels about this big that's on the third driver that takes into account the speed, does all the calculations and it gets shipped up into the cab. It's really neat. Um, so this is right before they repainted 470 in the speed lettering in the 40s. And then the diesel started to come in um, in the mate 40s. And this is uh, 705 in, at North Station. So even, even the diesels were going down in the B&M. We see B&M, Main Central stuff going back and forth all the time in this period. Um, so this is 470 right when they did that, that speed lettering paint job. I love this paint job. It's pretty similar to the, um, the B&M one at the time, similar, same colors. And so 470 started to be put on the, the smaller trains, the local stuff. And um, this shot's in Oakland in the 50s, and you can see the locomotive really isn't as clean as it used to be. Um, she was also seen a lot on the Rockland branch, pulling the tourist train to, to Samoset um, because the diesels were doing Portland and Bangor and the name trains. So whether 470's flue time was longer than was the last one to run out, or because it was at the time, excuse me, she was retired, she was the most high-tech steam locomotive because the two Hudsons that Main Central got in 1930, they got rid of them in the 50s. So 470 was it. Um, so on, for June 13th, 54, Main Central decided to say farewell to steam. So they brought 470 into Waterville, um, did an overhaul, repainted her. She looks really nice. This was taken on June 3rd on the turntable there in Waterville. And then she, uh, she went down to Portland and on June 13th in the morning, 10.03, brought her into the Portland Union Station to pull the last train. So here's a nice shot there at the station right before she departed. Departed a little late, actually, because they were waiting on a train pulled by a diesel to make it from Boston. <laughs> it wasn't a very nice day. It, it was rainy. It was cold. Um, but a big crowd turned up along the route. So this is Lewiston here, going north on the back road. The station is, is a little past the bridge there in the background. Then from Lewiston, we went up to Waterville. And then from Waterville, we went to Newport. And then from Newport up to Bangor. So this is neat. So this switcher here in the background in the Bangor yard there, which is close to where the waterfront concerts are now, if you're familiar with that. Um, they, it actually paced the locomotive from the end of the yard up into Union Station. Uh, and you can see all the photographers that are on the front there. And they, um, one of them was a photographer for WABI, videographer, camera person, whatever. And so you can see him, if you really zoom in on the picture, he's holding this camera and I don't know if he's cranking it or what, but you can see him holding this camera and we have the footage there from that. Um, and that's pretty neat. It goes right next to the locomotive, maybe going 10 miles an hour through Bangor. Um, so pulled into Bangor station, decoupled from the train and went into um, the yard there to get, to get uh, grease for the, next run down. 
One thing I love about this picture is the uh, mother duck here and her two little ducklings <laughs> just walking by. Uh, and then she was backed up to the uh, station in Bangor, uh, coupled to the train. And back in Waterville, um, the governor of the state, Governor Cross, and Spencer Miller, the president of the railroad, got on the locomotive. Fortunately, I don't have the picture in this, this presentation here, but they took a lot of um, pictures hanging off the smoke box there in the front, which are pretty neat. And then this is a great picture here, um, leaving Bangor. And then the biggest welcome was probably Waterville. Um, so remember, this, was, this wasn't a nice day. It was June, it was cold, and it was rainy. Um, but it was quite a, uh, quite a reception that she got in Waterville. And the high school, Waterville High School Band is right here. Um, it was reported that they were playing, um, I've been working on a railroad, so I don't know if they just played that on a loop over and over and over, or played it once, played it in the other songs, I'm not sure. Um, they're actually standing on what will be 470's plinth here. You can see it's just a pile of dirt at the moment. So after Waterville, crossed over into Winslow. And then from Waterville to Augusta. Station is just out of frame there on the right. Then I'm from Augusta to Brunswick. And then from Brunswick back to Portland. Um, and so Waterville is sort of the central of Main Central. Um, a bunch of the lines there converged. Um, it was actually right in the middle where Main Central began um, from the line coming from the south and the north and they consolidated. It, it was the Androscoggin and Kennebec and Penobscot and Kennebec, I forget the um, the other one that they combined to make Maine Central, but Waterville just seemed to be like the place to put 470, and it was also where the shops were. Uh, so in front of the station here on College Avenue in Waterville, uh, there was a bypass track for the platform that you can see in the top right that they swung out and they put this cribbing in with these junk ties up to the plinth for the locomotive. And the clearance was really close, and the curvature was, was pretty tight. I'm surprised that they did it, but they got it in. Um, in the video we have that captured it, I mean, they, were, they had to pull branches out of the way to get by. And that's where 470 sat uh, for a few years. Um, so this one's to you guys probably know who Russ Monroe is, I'm guessing. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so Russ took this picture and 470 was at this, um, this spot from 54 into 62. And passenger service for Maine Central ended in 1960. Um, so, from 60 to 62, there really wasn't much going on. Um, so locomotive wasn't looking so great. And the station there on the right really wasn't so, looking so hot there at the end. So the layout at this area was a little complicated. Um, there were two major crossings on College Avenue, which is, is Route 201 in Waterville. And going through the newspaper articles in the last few months of the Morning Sentinel, um, there, were prob there was probably an accident. Um, maybe once or twice a month at one of those crossings. Neither one had any sort of um, flagging devices, just had blinking lights, and one of them was just a flagging person. Um, so it was a really dangerous crossing. And so um, Main Central, Main DOT, um, they wanted to eliminate those crossings and that would result in the demolition of the station. And 470 was right in the way. Uh, so one thing that they did was in uh, October of 62, they gifted the locomotive to the city of Waterville. Um, so they had a company out of Portland make this sort of fake packaging thing for the celebration of 100 years of Maine, of Maine Central. And they wrapped up 470 and they gave it to the city. Um, they rebuilt that track and they pulled 470 out and she sat in the yard there. And through the 60s, once all of the work was done, um, 470 sat there and they there was there were a few articles in the paper, um, the, letters to the editor, about what how to get 470 back, looking for people to take 470, whatever. And there were a few different spots that they were looking to put it. Um, but the spot that ended up working was right outside the yard uh, in Waterville on College Avenue. Um, so they actually they cut into the main line. They didn't put in. There was no turnout put in. They cut into the back road, uh, put temporary tracks, swung it out, and placed 470 there in December of '69. Uh, excuse me, in December of 70. And in August of 71, they had a rededication ceremony. Um, so here's Spencer Miller here, uh, right in front of the locomotive, and they had 
Um, there was a guy who wrote a song about 470. He was there, he performed it. Um, the high school marching band did some routine there. Maine National Guard was there. Yeah, it was a pretty neat little display. Um, and 470 was repainted and looked really nice there in the early 70s. Um, and that was, uh, that was about it for maintenance. So this was taken here in the early 80s uh, and the jacket was still on there at the time and she wasn't looking so hot. Um, so she got one more repaint job there in the mid 80s. And that was it. Now the jacket on the locomotives, it's, it's uh, thin sheet metal and then all asbestos covering the, the boiler. So you can see from this picture here, the jacket wasn't doing so hot at the time. So asbestos started to leak out onto the ground. So I'm not sure who at the 470 Club got involved at this point and funded the abatement or if the city got involved, but all of the sheet metal was removed and then most of the asbestos from the locomotive was taken out at the time. Um, and was, the boiler was kept unpainted for a little while, but eventually it was painted black. And this is in the mid nineties here. Someone wanted to have Thomas the Tank Engine ideas on the smoke box. Um, but you can see that the red in the locomotive was really starting to fade. And so from the mid nineties to 2012, again, no maintenance. So that's when we come in. Um, so the city needed to have, they, need, they were redoing their insurance um, for all of their parks. And when, they're, when they went to 470s park, they couldn't get any kind of coverage on this. Um, all the, the, the locomotives painted lead paint, um, corro massive amounts of corrosion. There was still asbestos that was leaking out onto the ground. Um, drug paraphernalia in the cab, in the tender, it wasn't, it wasn't good. Uh, so this was the condition of the locomotive when we got there. Uh, on the top right, Swiss cheese metal there, that's the floor of the cab. Um, on the left is underneath the lip of the tender. Uh, on the bottom right are the bearings, and bearings shouldn't be looking like that. Uh, so they put out an RFP, um, request for proposals, and we were a group we formed uh, amongst, I think it was four other groups, but we were the only ones that were going to keep the locomotive in Maine. And our proposal was to move the locomotive to Downey Scenic Railroad on the Cowes branch in Ellsworth and do a full operational rebuild of the locomotive. Uh, the politics about it it, it, it took a long time to get it. I think it was three or four months of city council meetings was it didn't want to see 470 go but we didn't in our business model we had no we did not want to redo the whole locomotive and then just have it sit there and do this again in 50 years so we refused to keep it in waterville because we weren't going to get the, the city wasn't interested in putting up a building we didn't want to do all the work and then just have it all go to crap again so the only possible way to do it was for us to move it um so in 2013, we started to get into the locomotive. So this was the first time here where we actually got to take a good look and inspect it. Um, so on the left is Jason LaMontagne. He's inside the firebox. And I don't know if you can see it on the picture, but there's a seam here, right there. This is all new steel that was put in the last few years of the locomotive's life. So that was pretty great to find. Um, in the top right, we were taking shots. We had to take the paint off to take ultrasonic shots of the boiler to see the thickness. And in the bottom right is, um, we were cleaning the cinders from the last run out of the smoke box, which they never did, which is unfortunate um, because when um, coal ash gets wet, it turns acidic. And so there's massive amounts of corrosion at the bottom of the smoke box. So all the sheet metal on that is junk. The smoke box itself is okay though. So the contract with the city was, we needed to buy the locomotive for $25,000 so in the, fir in the first year, we got all the money, which is great. But another stipulation was that we needed to move the locomotive in another year. Uh, so we fundraised like crazy and we got all the money. And so we were able to move the locomotive in 2016. Uh, so periodically in the years leading up, take apart the locomotive, we go and do loop manu uh, lubrication every once in a while to make it easier for us. And uh, in August of 2016, uh, we had a crew come out and we moved the locomotive. It was a really cool day, yeah. So we had these two cranes come and we took it in sections. We did the boiler on one truck. 
Then we did the frame and drivers on another. Then we did the next day, we did the tender and then the two tender trucks and the trailing and leading truck of the locomotive. So here, here's um, the second day where everything's ready in front of the Waterville yard to go to Ellsworth. And on the way, um, the company that did this donated the trailer for the boiler. Uh, they actually got a flat tire on 95 and they needed to change the tire out. But luckily, it didn't make the paper. So we were happy about that. So that the next day here, we are in Ellsworth and we, uh, we loaded the ten unloaded the tender on the track and coupled up to it. And this was really neat because I mean, you, I'm so used to seeing it dead on the siding in Waterville and here it is coupled up to the locomotive in the first time in 70 years. It was great. And um, one thing that we got to see is because how the boiler was lifted up and the frame was separated where we had the, the trailing truck there, 470 is equipped with a booster engine, which is a two cylinder engine there, mounted horizontal for the trailing truck there, and we got to open it up. Uh, and it's been protected with an aluminum, the cover for it is, it's, it's, you know, it's about the width of the gauge, and it's made of aluminum, so we undid that and opened it up, and you can see the oil still at the bottom of that. I mean, that looks, that looks new there. So we were pretty excited about that, because this is um, a, little, a complex little machine. So since then, we, we had to fundraise. We needed to make a building. Um, we're not going to have 470 set out in the open again. So we had this building here on the bottom right built. And so what that's, it's this modular building of a company that was out of Canada, I believe, right across the border. And it's put on four or six containers. Uh, so we had recycled containers that we could use for storage immediately, which was great. And now we're out of the rain. So. We have a guy involved, his name is Bob DeWachter. He has, he's a machinist in um, the Saco area and he loves what he does. He actually has his own shop at his house. Uh, so he would take things off while we were still kind of figuring things out with the building and whatnot um, and do things, repair them on at its leisure when he was home. So this is the reversing, uh, the reverser there that would be on the, on the, locomo on the excuse me, on the um, engineer's side right up against the boiler where when you want to go forward, you crank it all the way to the right and the indicator, I wish I had it with me. If I went up to main before, I would have brought it with me, but the indicator goes all the way in and you flip up this lever here. This lever, you flip it up and it actuates this and this engages the booster engine, the, the one that we opened the cover from. And when you get going faster and you start reducing the cutoff because you won't need as much steam, this slides and it will drop down and disengage the booster automatically. It's pretty neat. Um, this is the dynamo that was taken off the boiler. Um, Vandals had gotten to this one many years ago, so the covers were missing, um, pieces were broken off. But there was a, there's a company up in Bangor that redoes generators, electrical equipment, whatever, um, and they took it upon themselves to restore it. So this is a new armature here. Um, everything got replaced um, in the electrical equipment. There's a turbine there on the left that was still good. Um, I think the whole shaft, I think, got replaced too. All of the internals, yeah, it was just junk. Um, and so here it is operating with the air with the, the headlights plugged into it. And there it goes. It works, works again. It's pretty neat. Um, we had to get new covers cast for it, um, WWNF in Wiscasset, they had one, so we had a, um, a cast made from theirs and, and replaced ours. So there it is, it's sitting in um, one, of the, one of the boxes there in Ellsworth. And on the right is uh, when we took it off the locomotive. So uh, on the right, it's, it's kind of flipped on its side on the pallet, but it, yeah, it looks great. It's bolted to that, that pallet now, so if we ever want to run it, we just use a pallet jack to take it out. Uh, so one thing that was going to need major replacement was the tender. Um, so what we, it was pretty early on that we took it back off the frame um, once we had a place to store it. And it wasn't going to be holding water anymore. Um, it was, at this point, it was probably when the locomotives were tired, they were going to have to replace the tender anyways. Um, so we took it off the frame pretty early to just get it out of the way. And 
we knew we were just gonna replace the entire thing. So we had a guy come out and make a full set of drawings. There's probably 200 drawings of all the steel inside it. Um, and we had it sent out to a manufacturer up in Millinocket. And they built us a whole new tank. Um, it's just tack welded really, um, really quick. It's really barely held together um, because we're gonna be riveting it. And so we got it and it looks, it's really nice. I mean, it is a mirror image of the old tank. And so in the last few, the last year or so, we've mapped out all the riveting lines and use a mag drill and drill them all out. And starting this summer, we're gonna be riveting this tank together. Now, for the frame, um, painted all in lead paint. And we found out that the last people that painted a locomotive just used whatever paint they had in their basement. Um, it just happened to be lead paint. So we. We used some, um, we found this pretty expensive, it's like a gel that you put on and it's sort of, it, it, it's like, a, it's a stripper, but it also like neutralizes the lead. I'm not sure the chemistry behind it. So we had already done that, but this sort of like goes beyond what our facility is at the time to completely strip and repaint. Um, so we had to contract this one out to get it completely um, blasted because we needed to do a thorough inspection of the frame. Uh, the frame's pretty impressive because this is just one casting and this transmits all the pulling power from the train, from the locomotive into the train. So it's, it's important to look for cracks. Um, luckily we didn't find any deal breakers and any cracks we were able to um, repair, which were around the drawbar pin where you would couple it to the locomotive. And we got that repainted and it looks really nice now. And then we did the, um, the trucks. Um, the trucks weren't looking so hot. There were some broken springs on them. Uh, so we had a manufacturer in Maine redo all the springs and the Waterville shops actually re turned the wheels for us. We repainted those and we put the, uh, put the frame back on. So here's the frame in the shop. And then about uh, a year later, we had to do some prep. We only work on the weekends and it's usually just one day a weekend. Um, so we don't, things go a little bit slow for us um, unless we contract something out. So it took about, I think it was eight months or so until we were able to put the, the new tank onto the frame. And uh, we wanted to make sure, uh, you probably can't read that, so let's, uh, let's zoom in. It says, uh, let's see if it's tender and put a fork in it. And then uh, we, put it, we had to make sure that we put on the capacity there at the bottom. Um, we like our puns. So backed it into the, uh, the building and that's where we are. That's where it sits right now and um, ready to be riveted back together. So uh, this is the big one now is the boiler. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, it, it, there's definitely some places that we're gonna have to, uh, have to fix. And um, what the biggest thing are the flexible stay bolts which are riddled all over the boiler. Um, I was hoping that I had a, well, it's in the back, but I was hoping I had a, um, a board here to explain it. But um, so there's, if you're looking at the, a section through the boiler, you just cut it in half and kind of look at it. You know, you'll see, you'll have the firebox sheet and then you'll have the exterior of the boiler. And when it's under pressure, they want to move away from each other. So these are bolts that keep it together, but you want them to be flexible because heat, heat, cool, temperature, whatever, it's gonna, um, it's gonna contract and it's gonna expand. So if you just have rigid bolts, they're gonna shear off um, when, you're, when you're working on the locomotive. So they have flexible stay bolts. So they're bolted into the firebox like a regular bolt, but then onto the exterior, um, they're just, they're kind of just held on with like a, a sleeve and they're able to, to move a little bit. We have to replace all of them. That's all of these. Uh, I've heard, I don't know the number off the top of my head. It's 200 something, and I, they, um, they all have to be cut and machined. And they're all, most of them are gonna be different sizes. And then radially, they go over the top. So they're all different lengths and it's, it's just not gonna be fun. Um, so we went through the process of removing all of the caps, which you can see on the diagram on the right is the square bolt on the top. Um, we had to heat all of them because they, they were all rusted to each other. So this is what the back of the boiler looks like right now. Um, it's a little hard to see, but down here at the bottom, 
Down here at the bottom was where the cab floor was. And at the top, there's a vent in steam locomotive cab and uh, it wasn't waterproof. So all the water would, all the rain would go in and it would sit and then just be right up against the boiler. I'd say maybe half an inch, three quarters of an inch of steel is just gone. So we're gonna have to put in a whole, a big patch, maybe like a foot high, maybe two feet, um, all along the bottom there to fix that. And another thing, they, there are a bunch of different repairs that Main Central did that we have to remove and see what's going on. Um, one thing here, it's might not be able to see on this picture. There's a, it's called a wet patch and it's right on the corner here. So it's not only goes around this way, but on the radius over the top. So it's got this curvature and then it, it curves over. So it's kind of a complicated little repair. So we have to take that off, see what's going on and then address it um, accordingly. Another patch we have to do here is um, when you retire a steam locomotive, I guess the practice was at the time to cut a section of the dome out and ship that to Washington to like, verify that the locomotive was dead. It was, so there's a square cutout on the, um, on the dome here that we're gonna have to replace, or not replace the dome, put a, put a patch on. But nothing's a deal breaker, um, it's just gonna be expensive. So we started the process last year, removing out all the tubes, the flues, and the superheater units. And these are, these are complex little things. Um, there's quite a few of them. Um, we're hoping that none of them had any water intrusion and none of them, they're all gonna be good and we can just put them right back in. Um, we're not holding our breath. Um, so here is the, uh, the current state of the smoke box. Excuse me. Um, you can see at the bottom, there's some corrosion there. So this tube sheet's probably gonna be replaced. So we have to get a new one of these machined. So right now we're finishing out, cutting out these, all these tubes and flues and we gotta get into the boiler. We have to map it out with chalk and we have to get the, um, the thickness throughout the entire thing. And we'll address any pairs that we're gonna find that the FRA makes us do. It's really their decision. Um, so shifting from that, um, this is another thing that Bob had done. Um, so 470 was equipped with a Stoker engine. Um, it was put in, I just scanned the plans for this last night. Um, in 41 was when the plans were, were stamped when they installed this. And so it just stops the, the you, when you think of early days of steam locomotives, the, the fireman would be shoveling the coal. Well, this is uh, just a two cylinder engine. And in 470's case, it sat in the tender and it powers an Archimedes screw, which brings the coal in up into the firebox. And then there are jets that the fire, fireman can control and spread out the, the coal accordingly. Um, so we took this out and opened it up back in, I don't know, 2017 or so. And uh, it didn't look so great, but Bob took it apart replaced all of the bearings, anything that was corroded, he, he had it redone, um, and that's completely restored and ready to go. It's really nice too, you hook that up to air and it operates, it's cool. Um, another unfortunate thing about 470 is um, the whistle was stolen off in the 50s. Um, we thought that it might have been like a gift to some governor person when they retired, whatever, but we could never find it. And Main Central sort of had their own custom whistles. It wasn't just an off-the-shelf one. Um, and so uh, a guy named Bernie Perch up in Maine, he uh, took it upon himself to make a new one. Uh, so he got his hands on a Main Central whistle and made a new one for us. And they normally wouldn't be cast with the locomotive's name on the top, but he did that for us. And it's really nice. Um, I wish I could have brought it with me, but it's about, it's about this big. And not only that, he made two. So one where eventually, I think we're gonna we're talking about um, either s selling for a fundraising thing or using it as like a traveler. So like four, when 470 is running, she can have a whistle and then if for whatever meets or special occasions, let other locomotives use the main central whistle, you know, whatever. Um, so I'd like to end the presentation um, saying this is that it's easy to get angry at Waterville and other cities that get these locomotives and let them deteriorate. Um, but got to realize that, that a city's priority is to plow their roads and to, to pay their teachers. And if it wasn't for them to take the locomotive, then it would have been cut up and used for razor blades. So um, to, to 
sort of remember Waterville, we had this plate cast here. Um, once locomotives running, we're gonna put this, I believe, on the back of the tender so that um, the history from 54 to, to um, 2013, you know, it's remembered that Waterville saved the locomotive. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I got for the formal presentation. Um, this is a shot in Bangor here um, with a tracing train and uh, you know, I'll take any questions and I might be able to get uh, some other pictures. Let's, uh, let's hear it for Question. Hi. Hi. I'm Danny Hag. Hi. I was on the restoration of the 410. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So I, I appreciate what you're going on, but I was with the National Park Service and I've down a steam plant several times, and I've been through the uh, locomotive down there. Oh, okay, 3713? Yeah. Yeah, okay. But uh, you're doing your own service, and I know the work you're doing. Yeah, and it's... Um, my trade was, was a steam fitter, uh, boiler maker. Oh, okay. So, but, so you recognize a lot of the stuff that I, I'm pointing out. Yeah. all. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, 37, 13, I mean, they've got, they're lucky because you guys existed. So yeah. all of the plans and drawings that got saved, they, you, they, they have, us. yeah. Um, they all of ours are, went in the trash. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I've been working in the last couple months with Rick and I, want, I wanted to mention this too, is that um, lucky that you got the Maine Central and Boston and Maine work together because there are a lot of plans yes. um, where 470 was down in Billerica or, or in Boston. Um, where they just added a line yeah. on the plans and said for 470 use these dimensions and so I've done, I don't know, maybe 200 or yeah. so plans. Well I remember when they get started they come up to the park service mm -hmm. and uh, they went through um, the prints yeah. and uh, they're able to give them a lot of information that on the uh, uh, 3713 Mm, yeah, yeah, they, are. they didn't have uh, some boiler repairs and things. Mm. But uh, it was, uh, it, it's a yeoman job. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm down, in, I'm also down here. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I can only do so much down here. So, I mean, we're lucky that it works out with the archives here is that I can be down here and I actually, I have one of those scanners so I can scan them at my leisure at, at home. And that's, that's really how I can help down here. Uh, one of the things is, I think a half a ton of rust went down my shower drain. Yeah, probably. <laughs> you know, I'll find it in my hair or behind my yeah, ears. And, yeah. yeah. Oh, my rust is unbelievable. Um, unbelievable. Yeah, it's like I've, I have a bunch of friends in Portland, and so I would go work on the locomotive and go down, and we'd go out to eat or whatever, and they're all dressed up, and I come back, and I'm covered in coal and whatever. <laughs> yeah. Covered yeah. in coal and rust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was quite an enjoyable job that we did mm. for 10 Myself, Jim Diggs is uh, the main main driving force mm. of it. So, so, congratulations, and that you got it this far. And I know you guys will get it fished up. Yeah, thanks. And again. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. On the, the tank, tender tank. Yeah. You said the frame was good. Yeah. What, what type? I'm just curious because you know, okay, we did it on the floor. What, what type of wood did you? I saw you already had some decking on it. Yeah, I can I can find out the particular. I I, I want to say pine. I don't think we spent anything. We got like oak or something something hard of that. I'm not. Yeah, it wasn't we, use, we use PT on it. Yeah. You know, just pressure treated. But we, yeah, probably. I mean, I, I don't know if we could yeah, see on these you, pictures. Yeah. You probably would want something better than that. Yeah, yeah we very very well could. Yeah. Um, probably. I'm not, I'm not. There there is. Bill Alexander, who's on the board, he he's sort of like he's got the woodworking shop, and this yeah. is like his baby. Is any any that wood stuff? Tank is beautiful. Yeah, we got we got lucky with this tank. It's really cool. I mean, we're used just so used to seeing rusted holes all over the place and seeing this brand new one. What we have to do next? Uh, and four four tens tank is uh, yeah, or a, a tender. Yeah. Um, the tendon's getting kind of tender. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 470 is past that point. I mean, look, I mean, look at, yeah. you just. Any thought of converting the tender to roller bearings for future operations? So, that's a good question. We, we did get, um, let's go back to some bearing shots. We did get um, an offer for donation for roller bearings when we first started there. I, I, I'm not sure what, um, what the last email was with the company. I think it was Mick, McRail. 
Uh, and so we, we thought about it for a little while. Uh, and so at, at the moment when we're, how we're going to be running 470 is when you, the purpose of the restoration is you want to preserve the way that a certain thing, that things were maintained and run when it was new. Um, so our chief mechanical officer uh, sort of didn't want to do the roller bearings because the plane bearings here ran, I mean, it ran for 30 years with plane bearings and still life on some of those. I mean, we, we aren't replacing the bearings right now. With, with, we're not redoing them. They're just staying um, plane bearings just because we want to maintain and operate them just how they would have done it. Um, if we run into any issues, this will bring up another topic. The railroad is disconnected right now. Um, there's a section taken out by Pan Am um, up in Brewer um, with the with the railroad network. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of politics involved with getting. We'd love to, we'd love to have 470 pull some sort of special excursion, whatever, between Portland and Boston again. Um, but you got to remember the politics that are involved with the different kinds of insurance. Um, that's going to be MBTA territory. Amtrak's going to get involved. Um, CSX now, Maine DOT, because they own the line the 470's on. It's just all of these things. And so we haven't gone through the, um, the process of seeing what these other companies would want to run the locomotive because we don't even have an old locomotive that's running. Um, so we're going to be really crossing the bridge with things like that once we actually are more comfortable with operating the locomotive. So, I mean, this could be, what, 10, 10 years. So if we go 10 years from now and we're running 470 and we decide that we want to go to a different railroad, all of the politics, everyone says, that's great. You need to put roller bearings in. We're probably going to put roller bearings in. But that's step 3,000 and we're on step 20 at this point. So that's a long answer to your question. but. Not yet. We're going to go with the plane bearings for now. All the work that you've done, I mean, it looks like a tremendous amount of work, even the cost of moving it and all yeah. that. It's all been through private donations? You've been yeah. Out? Yeah, we've had a few big grants. Off the top of my head, I don't remember what we had when we, we did the move in 2016. Um, I, th I think it was about 80000 to do the, the move. Uh, so that was over a hundred that we raised. We had to purchase the locomotive from the city. Um, so it was a hundred something and change to, to, to move it. And it was, yeah, it was donations. We sold a lot of hats. Um, <laughs> a lot of hats. But yeah, we got some pretty good donation, pretty good grants. I think we had a few for 30 grand or whatever. Um, I'm not involved in the grant writing, but they're always going, looking, probably finding you guys grants for 410, sorry. Any other questions? Yeah. Was that locomotive uh, equipped with siphons? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I've got a, I have a shot in the firebox. <laughs> I think they looked all right. Um, let's see if I can get back in the firebox. Yeah, you can sort of see it there to the left of his head. So there were, I think it's two. Um, there has never been any note of any condition of the siphons, so I don't think there are any um, big red flags. Once we get all the tubes pulled out and we're, we're going to town with the, um, you know, the testing, you know, they could be um, in good shape, they could be in bad shape. Um, that's actually one of the drawings I scanned was patches to the thermic siphons. siphons. Um, so we have some sort of documentation of how they would repair it. And um, let's say we have um, main locomotive and machine works involved, which is um, Brian, uh, is it Fonsley? Fa Fa Fonsley, forgot his, how to say his last name. Um, he did like um, 7470 and all of the narrow gauge locomotives up in Maine. So he's involved. He's doing, he's, he's, the boiler is his thing. I'm not, I'm not a boiler engineer. So, and he, he's super qualified to do it. So that, that's, that's his, his project there. Is your plan is to run this on the Calisper? Yeah, so right now the, they've got a few miles um, on that, and then once we get going and we're comfortable with the locomotive, you know, go more. For that? What? Is the lines heavy enough? To yeah, they run, I think they all have 80 or 80, 85 pound rail, um, which is what Main Central, I mean, that's what 470 ran on. Yeah. Did they make a flex uh, whole boiler? Um, what is is that ultra is that the testing yeah. um that's what we're doing right now we're ripping the tubes out to to do that survey yeah that'll give you a good like, map of, yeah of what you gotta do and what you 
Yeah, we anticipate we're gonna have to spend some money there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, and they'll find things. Yeah, I'm sure. It, and they, when they, during the locomotive's life, the locomotive was delivered um, to run at 180 and they bumped it up to 195 PSI. So um, whatever factor of safety is gonna be even like slimmer because they bumped up from the manufacturer. So we'll see. Yeah. I know you said this was used like initially um, between, uh, was it Portland and Bangor service? Yeah, yeah. Is there any documentation of it ever making it down to the ferry landing there? I haven't seen anything. So there is, 470 pulled a portion of the Flying Yankee, um, or not the Flying Yankee, um, the Bar Harbor Express, um, which I think is what, did I say Flying Yankee? It might've been Bar Harbor Express here, which is this. That is a Flying Yankee. Well, there are sh there is a shot actually, it's in um, your Flickr archive of pulling um, Bar Harbor Express, but it was from Bangor South. So, I don't know if there were restrictions of 470 going there. Um, it was gone pretty early. I think, I think they, they ditched the ferries in the 40s or the late 30s. Um, but no, I haven't seen any picture of 470 on, on, on that line east of Bangor. Uh, Peter? Yeah. Would you care to comment on your interest in the main central? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Society? Yeah, so. Um, you guys are fortunate in that in 71, when the B&M um, still existed, that you formed. Um, and that didn't happen for Maine Central. And when they got bought out in the 80s um, by Guilford, they had a campaign um, where they put an ad in the paper saying that you were clearing out the offices. Um, you come in and you give $5, we'll give you a box, and you can walk in to the office. Whatever you can fit in the box, you can you could take and get back in line, pay another five, bo five bucks, get another box, go in. And so that's why you see main, main central stuff all over eBay, all over di different kinds of archives throughout the state of Maine. You have a, a significant amount of St. Maine central stuff in your collection um, because it never happened. And uh, the 470 club was sort of the closest thing that was kind of a main central historical society. They sort of, they got rid of their archives in the last few years. Um, and I know I've got a bunch of Maine Central stuff in my collection, uh, and I really don't know what to do with it, and I really don't want to continue fragmenting everything across the state of Maine. Um, so we started the Maine Central Historical Society. So we have an event coming up um, in May, uh, the Belfast and Moosehead Lake Railroad. We got a train ride. Um, we're gonna have some light refreshments, and we're just gonna sort of talk about any kind of goals or anything special. Um, what people might have um, to include in the historical society. And we're doing digital too. So if you have some rare plan, photo, whatever, um, and you wanna keep the physical one, we are gonna have a list of standards of how to digitize it, or you can give it to us to digitize. We'll take a digital copy, and then you can get to keep your copy. Um, and think that might entice people to give more um, if they're, they don't wanna let it go. I know, I know a couple guys that love their personal collection, and that's great. Um, but then if they, it gets disposed, they, there's a fire at their house, they pass away, family go through their stuff, ends up in the trash. So it's, I think it'll, it'll help out. So you got to start somewhere. It's just, instead of 71, it's 2023 now. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Beautiful. Beautiful.